The Nazca Lines are undoubtedly one of Earth's most perplexing ancient relics. Not only are they unimaginably big, but their accuracy still baffles all who try to explain them, even to this day. With many of these ancient drawings seemingly only visible or indeed fully appreciated from great altitude, many people over the centuries have predictably pondered upon the possibility of there having once been ancient flying machines. And although many of these ancient marks could be perceived as possibly past runways or landing sites, there exists one site in particular that possesses some of the most compelling, if little shared, characteristics of them all. Known as El Fuerte, it can be found amongst a pre-Columbian archaeological site in Bolivia. It is believed that for over a thousand years, the site served as a ceremonial center for various pre-Columbian cultures, ultimately becoming the home of the Inca, who turned the site into the east capital of their empire. We have often stated that we strongly believe that at some point within Earth's distant history, a highly advanced intercontinental civilization once flourished, building enormous stone structures. With knowledge and capabilities in stone carving and building, we, the modern man, are yet to unravel. And although the site consists of an average ancient settlement, complete with buildings, architecture, and irrigational ruins, the most intriguing feature of the site, and the purpose for the video, is what was once carved out of the solid rock atop the mountain. Along the crest of the hill is the most intriguing feature of the site, or possibly Nazca itself, known as the El Cascabel, which can be translated as the rattle. It is two parallel lines oriented to the eastern sky with a position of azimuth at 71 degrees and an altitude of about 6.75 degrees. Interestingly, this is the exact orientation of the rise of Pleiades at different times within history. Why was this curious carving etched into the top of this mountainside within Bolivia? Was this ancient site once used as a launching pad? Furthermore, intriguingly, much of the surrounding stone seems to have experienced ancient quarrying. Is this ancient mountain the site of an ancient quarry, once done by a group who had flying Vimanas at their disposal? An incredible sight, which we find highly compelling. Since the incident at Roswell, many UFO enthusiasts have been certain that Earth has been visited by extraterrestrial beings many claiming that the incident was indeed a UFO crash, and that the U.S. government not only covered the event up, but seized the craft and have been busily attempting to reverse-engineer this technology ever since. These claims have been verified by a number of claimed whistleblowers who say they have worked on such projects at none other than Area 51 at Groom Lake. Since these claims were made, the CIA, along with many other bodies of U.S. government, have begun to release hundreds of files, including witness testimonies of countless military personnel and civilians, testimonies in satellite and radar tracks made by individuals who have either had an encounter or have experienced unexplainable events connected to mysterious craft, often moving at seemingly impossible speeds or shutting down missile silos. These events would undoubtedly be a worry to the powers that be. The concern is that a hostile nation may have developed or successfully reverse-engineered these technologies in secret. However, there is also overwhelming evidence to suggest that these sightings were not of man-made craft, but indeed that of extraterrestrial life. For not only are these craft witnessed over sensitive military complexes, but a number of experiences have also surrounded schools, two of which we thought were compelling enough to bring to the forefront of our studies, this due to the number of eyewitnesses and what their testimony suggests. Although the accounts from a school in Zimbabwe were initially discredited, regardless of the fact that over 20 students witnessed a craft land in the school field, with the students subsequently going to meet the landing craft, 
and being no more than arm's reach from the beings that emerged, many scientists and psychologists have attempted to discredit the event by putting it down to mass hysteria. The witnesses to this event continue to argue that it did indeed occur. Furthermore, supporting their claims, other encounters have been experienced at other schools around the globe. At approximately 11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 6th of April, 1966, students and a teacher from Westall High School in Australia reported seeing a flying object, described as a gray or silvery-green saucer-shaped craft with a slight purple hue and about twice the size of a family car. According to the students, the object was descending, overflew the high school, and disappeared behind a stand of trees. Approximately 20 minutes later, the object reportedly reappeared, climbed at speed, and departed towards the northwest. Some accounts describe the object as being pursued by five unidentified aircraft. Thanks to these, and thousands, possibly millions of other testimonies from people of countless disciplines, the acceptance that these craft exist has been forced upon the U.S. government and other governments globally. It would seem full disclosure, rather than the trickle we see now, is not a case of if, but is now one of when. It is a pursuit of truth which we find highly compelling. It is still largely unknown just how colossal the great city of Ur could have once been. Ur, once the most important Sumerian city-state in ancient Mesopotamia, around 3rd millennium BC, is where the remains of the great ziggurat lay. And just as with the ancient city, only the foundations of this once enormous pyramid still exist today. Just how big this pyramid once was is now left to the imagination, although one could calculate the structure's original possible size based on the ascent angle of many other ancient pyramidal structures from around the world. A range between 48 to 53 degrees would be a very safe benchmark to use, which would have made this once complete structure located on the Daikar province in South Iraq an awe-inspiring sight. Yet what must be the most interesting of details regarding this very ancient structure, characteristics of which make this building stand out as obviously a very important piece of the puzzle regarding the pyramids, has to undoubtedly be the living quarters which were actually built into the pyramid for the use of an ancient alien, a god, who apparently came from the sky. Before delving into the details of which I feel it is important to point out, our previous video covering Mario Bildrup's compelling work, Collaborative data which correlates over 500 ancient structures on Earth to past cardinal reference points or North Pole locations from over half a million years ago. Interestingly, he singles out the great ziggurat among others. In particular, the Sphinx as noticeably the most ancient of monuments that he has correlated on Earth. If his work becomes peer-reviewed, it would, along with numerous other research projects, strongly suggest certain monuments on Earth have survived several ice ages, the city of Ur's pyramid being but one of these ancient sites. Regardless of Mario's compelling work, historical facts surrounding this ancient alien god, who is said to have resided within this great pyramid within Iraq, has already been translated and thus well-established on many occasions. The great ziggurat consists of successive platforms which have a solid core of mud brick which was then covered by burnt bricks. This outer layer is said to have protected the core from the elements. The mainstream archaeological and historical understanding of the construction is that it began under King Ur-Namu of the 3rd dynasty of Ur, around the 21st century BC, and was completed by his son, King Shulgi. The great ziggurat of Ur was located in the temple complex of the city-state, which was the administrative heart of Ur. Although we would postulate, just like the ancient Egyptian cities, which also build up around these monumental and mysterious structures, were merely modern colonizations of sites which were far older. It is a well-known fact that many cities, towns, villages, and indeed temples are often rebuilt, reconstructed upon much older foundations. It is a common mistake to perceive a historical understanding's beginning, which occurred at a certain point within history, as that of the site's creation. 
Many sites all over the world are far older than that of the academic records made upon said subjects. The Great Ziggurat of Ur is largely accepted as having been dedicated to the moon god Nana, who is the patron deity of the city. It is interesting that Nana is a very ancient deity indeed, and of course, in all possibility, was once a very real entity, an ancient alien who visited Earth and attributed as a god. It is likely that this occurred at night, thus making him or her a moon god. Why, for example, would you create a monumentally sized building in the dedication of this god, with a throne which rested upon the top, overlooking the city? Why would one feel the requirement to build living quarters into the temple, a bedchamber complete with furnishing? Why would one completely build the structure around the living need of an imaginary giant, if one was never intending on using it? Nana has turned up in mythology from cultures throughout the world over the ages. And this, of course, may have been for good reason. She also appears in Norse mythology in the 6th century, thus having been connected by some scholars with the Sumerian goddess Inanna, the goddess Babylonian Ishtar, or the Phrygian goddess Nana, mother of the god Attis. Scholar Rudolf Simek opines that identification with Inanna, Nanar, or Nana is hardly likely due to the large distances in time and location between the figures. Yet, alas, this form of conclusion, based on academic paradigm rather than a sheer possibility, is a very dangerous mindset indeed. Scholar Hilda Ellis Davidson says that while the idea of a link with Sumerian Inanna, Lady of Heaven, was attractive to early scholars, the notion seems unlikely. Though she too lacks a compelling argument for her conclusion, we find the notion of scholars, assuming, to be a dangerous scenario for the rest of humanity, and we perceive such attitude as an attack on open critical thought. We do, however, find the facts surrounding the possible past existence of Nana, along with the theories surrounding the true antiquity of this one enormous structure, to be highly compelling. It is largely accepted within mainstream archaeology that modern civilization started with Iraq within what we now call Mesopotamia. Iraq is currently accepted as the longest surviving continuous area of civilization anywhere on Earth. The question is, how did this very ancient culture excel so successfully within their surrounding environment? How did they develop such sophisticated methods of survival at such a primitive time in our history? There actually exists a series of figurines made by unknown people that predated the Sumerian culture by some magnitude, known as the Ubadian people. Were these the source of Sumerian wisdom? The only problem is that the figures are representative of a race of reptilians, a discovery at the Al Ubaid archaeological site where many very ancient artifacts were found, depicting humanoid figures with lizard characteristics. The origins of the Ubadian people is unknown. Their entire existence is a huge mystery to mainstream history, and although this race of people may in all possibility be the pioneers for modern civilization, very little is known about them. They apparently lived in large village settlements within mud brick houses. They developed architecture, agriculture, and farmed the land using irrigation. Their domestic architecture involved large houses, open courtyards, paved streets, even food processing equipment. Some of these villages began to develop into towns, temples began to appear, as well as monumental buildings, such as in Eridu, Ur, and Uruk, once the capitals of the Sumerian civilization. Many of the figurines exhibit different postures, and in most cases they appear to be wearing a curious helmet of some kind, and have some form of padding around the shoulders. Other figurines were found to be holding staffs, or a scepter, possibly as a symbol of their status amongst the group. Each figurine was clearly intended to represent a unique individual. Some female figurines were even discovered holding babies, with the child also represented as a reptilian creature. Just who were the Obadian people? Were these figures intended to represent tribe members? More research into their appearance and information surrounding the origins of their knowledge is clearly needed. 
We will of course keep you posted on any future developments regarding this mysterious, valuable and quite possibly reptilian tribe.